Football at four. Let's bring Johnny Mac into our football at four conversation for Tuesday. And there's still a lot to build on here as uh, obviously uh, the draft is still in focus and uh, we will continue to look at it here. John, over at Sports Illustrated, uh, you wrote about a sleeper pick from this draft. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of guys that you could be a nominee here, but I think the guy that you most people probably don't even remember. I lost so much track of what was happening on Saturday. I mean, they were trading out, moving around, adding picks. I mean, so if you were to mention a sleeper, who's that guy for you? Uh, well, Casey Tuhill is the one I, I wrote about today. He was the last pick. He was the seventh-round pick. In a lot of ways, uh, I think, you know, he was – almost the poster child of this draft and the fact that the Eagles kind of shifted from college production, which they've been placing a heavy emphasis on, to athleticism. Uh, and, you know, Next Gen Stats does their athleticism index, and he got essentially a perfect 99. He can't get better um, than that score. Uh, and that kind of defines – their entire draft, throughout the draft, they had the top athleticism score. Um, what makes him a little bit different, he played at Stanford, is he was productive as well. And he was really good on the field. So it's interesting. He fell a little bit because he's a tweener. Um, 250, is he, is he a defensive end? Is he an outside linebacker? And that's always difficult. Uh, but the Eagles are going to put him at defensive end. And, hey, he can, in theory, be real, that really athletic edge rusher. So somebody to keep an eye on if we ever get back on the field. Yeah, now yesterday they exercised Derek Barnett's fifth-year option, Casey Tuhill, who you just mentioned there. What does the defensive end position look like now? Because it's an area that they decided on draft day that they really you know, didn't have to focus on. Yes, they got a guy in the seventh round, but uh, what else is there? Uh, because, uh, it, you know, obviously that was an area edge rusher that they typically value. Yeah, and you can argue they, they could have used an extra edge rusher, and that's what they'll be looking for. I mean, Jim Schwartz likes to use that rotation. They have three kind of penciled in. Brandon Graham, obviously, Derek Barnett are the starters. Josh Sweat would be kicking up to that number three role that was Vinnie Curry last year. Uh, Vinny's still a free agent. Who knows if you can get a decent deal with him done. Uh, maybe he could be back, uh, but I think the Eagles would prefer to go in a different direction. Uh, and then they have a cast of thousands. I mean, Joe Osman is coming back from a torn ACL. Deshaun Hall is coming back from a torn ACL. Uh, they traded for Jannard Avery. People forget about him, but they gave up a fourth-round pick. So, they like him. Uh, I just mentioned uh, Two Hill. So they got they got a lot of bodies, but they need to find. And Sharif Miller, nobody talks about him. He was a fourth round pick last year, barely got on the field. Uh, so a lot of options, and and somebody's going to have to step up and and be that fourth guy. Yeah, uh, you know, I think that's going to be uh, very interesting. You mentioned Joe Osman. He was a guy that at this time last year we were talking about, hey, or more so once they got around training camp, that, hey, he's a guy they had some plans for, and obviously those plans never materialized because he ended up getting hurt. So you wonder if those plans are going to be re-put into focus. Yeah, I think a lot depends on, you know, how does he come back and, and how does he recover from that torn ACL? Remember, he he tore it in in August in training camp, and they did. I mean, they were they were putting a role in this defense for him specifically. Um, that's not only an edge rusher, but also a, a joker type stand up rusher from the inside. They were putting a specific package in for him. Where Stashawn Hall, for instance, he got he tore his ACL on the last play in Week 17. So um, there's a big difference. Um, He's he's got uh, a head start when it comes to rehab, but anytime you're talking about a player like Ospin, who the reason he didn't get drafted in the first place was because he was undersized. He was he was a great pass rusher in college. I mean, great pass rusher, but he's just short and he's small, and he relies on explosion and he relies on speed and 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 being able. Um, 
to use that speed rush. And if he loses even a tick of that explosion, he's not going to be able to make it. Mm-hmm. So it, a lot depends on how healthy he is and, and how the rehab went. John, uh, let's look at uh, Prince Tega Wanango. We talked a little bit about him yesterday. I probably butchered that. But three guys today that was projected to be higher in the draft. He ended up getting hurt. Uh, and he was a guy, uh, you know, that uh, many people thought could have been, you know, a top 50 I saw to 100 player. He goes 210 here. Now, obviously, he's not going to start right away. Uh, but imagine you're imagining that he's going to be the new Vitae, I would guess. Yeah, that's what I would uh, expect, certainly short term. And you think, I mean, Lane Johnson's got plenty left at right tackle and Andre Dillard obviously entering his second year at left tackle. So in theory, you're not going to need a, a either tackle position uh, for a number of years moving forward. But we've seen how important that swing tackle position is. It got uh, Halapula Vati Vata, essentially $50 million, uh, just being uh, that valuable a player. Um, and, yeah, I mean, this guy is athletic enough to do it. Um, he's raw. I mean, he's from Nigeria, obviously. He picked up the game late. Uh, and that's the only reason, you know, you talked about those projections. Most people – uh, projected him as a second, maybe some as a third round pick, but everybody had him in that range. Um, and he tore his meniscus, and, and there were some health concerns. Uh, some teams took him off their boards. Obviously, he fell down because of that injury. But, you know, he's a very young guy. You would think, in theory, he'd be able, even if there's a little bit of a struggle early. He mentioned he's about 90% already. Uh, when we talk to him on Zoom. So um, he should be ready to go for training camp. And, yeah, that's another high-ceiling pick. And that, more than anything else, kind of defines this draft uh, for the Eagles. I think there's a lot of prospects that are in that boom or bust category. And some of them are probably going to boom, and some of them are, are probably going to bust. Yeah, and you wonder, you know, where does that leave, like, Jordan Maialata, who was the project guy from two years ago. He's now entering his third year and really has not uh, – I don't know how much advancements he's had when you look at the tackle position. So, I mean, is it really Prince against Maialata for that swing tackle spot? And I guess you could throw uh, the the kid Driscoll in there as well, but he probably projects more inside. We'll get to him in a bit. But what's Maialata's deal? Well, uh, Jordan, you know – <laughs> uh, and I joke about Baldy all the time. I, I don't know where this puts his bust. I don't know if they're still making it for Kent. <laughs> but, I mean, he he was already uh, – oh, when the Eagles brought him in, I mean, this is a guy who never played American football before. And, I mean, at all. So, I, I mean, he was the rawest of raw prospects. And, basically – the Eagles just took a chance on him because he's six eight, he's three fifteen, he's incredibly agile and incredibly athletic. Um, and you know the hope was by year three he would turn into a, a viable swing tackle. Never goal to make him a starter, but this was the goal to get to this year and him be able to take over and be that swing tackle. Problem is he hurt his back last year. Uh, and he was put on an injured reserve very early in the season. And what that did is meant he couldn't practice. So even as he got healthy, and he was pretty much healthy by December, he wasn't able to practice at all. And that hurt him more than it does the average person for obvious reasons. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, he needs practice, and he needs reps, and he didn't get them last year. So I think that set him back, and I think, it's one of the reasons the Eagles drafted Prince because they're kind of saying, eh, we got to go out and find a spring tackle. Yeah, and I guess we can lump uh, Quez Watkins and John Hightower together. We kind of touched on this a little bit yesterday, but uh, you add Marquise Goodwin, who they traded for on Saturday, and I- I'm interested to see your take on what that wide receiving um, depth chart is going to look like here because you got Rieger, Ward. I guess Jeffrey is not going to be ready, but our J.J. Ortega Whiteside, Deshaun Jackson, and then the four new wideouts that you added this weekend. 
Yeah, I don't think there's going to be as much change as people think. Uh, certainly, um, you know, I, I, I don't think all Sean's going to be back. I've, I've said that. You mean at all? Uh, no, I, I, he's not going to be back here. Mm-hmm. I, I think ultimately uh, the Eagles are going to do something. Certainly they'll try to trade him in some kind of salary dump. Uh, if they're not able to that do that, I think ultimately uh, they release him. But uh, there's no need, there's no hurry to do it now. I mean, there's no off-season work. He's not in the building. You don't have to worry about that issue. Um and he's not healthy, as you mentioned, anyway. So you can afford to wait probably as long as possible. Who knows if we start to ramp this thing up and, and training camp does start and there's injuries somewhere else and somebody needs a veteran receiver, maybe that's where you get something done. I think that's how we rose into thinking. But ultimately, I don't think he's going to be back. But Deshaun is going to be back. And Greg Ward, I, I mean, Doug Peterson has made it pretty clear he's going to be back and he's going to be a part of this offense. Uh, and I think that took people a little bit by surprise. And J.J. Arthaga Whiteside's going to be back. I, I keep telling people they're not giving up on him after one year. Nor should they. Um, nor should they, no. So you start talking about, okay, there's not a ton of room. You're only going to keep five, maybe six receivers. Uh, and Jalen Rager is going to be one of them, first round pick. That's four. So you got one or two spots for Marquise Goodwin, uh, Hightower, uh, Watkins. You know, one of them obviously isn't going to make it. Um, you do have an expanded practice squad, so I think ultimately they would like to keep the young guys around. And remember, they're later round picks. It's not like. They're going to expect to make splashes. Um, But if they do, if they're concerned that they can't get one of them through waivers, for instance, they probably just move on from Goodwin because he's got chronic knee injuries. He's um, renegotiated his deal, so he's essentially at the veteran minimum. They can move on with no real impact. so I, I don't think there's going to be as much change as people think at the wide receiver position. Well, it's going to be Jalen I, I, I guess one of the questions would be then, did they go overboard with drafting so many receivers? We kept saying they needed speed and they needed receivers, but you added Watkins in the sixth, Hightower in the fifth. You traded for a guy. You drafted. I mean, did they? could they have filled other needs? Uh, in other words, are they, are they having these guys essentially competing against each other for like one spot? Yeah, they are. Um, and you could argue, and we've we've talked about that a lot, that's what it comes to, need versus uh, taking what you think might be the best player. And I, I can't really tell you what the Eagles' thinking was in the fact that uh, are they saying there was no, for instance, they still need a running back. Uh, we've talked about that a lot. They signed a couple of undrafted kids, and Sometimes you can find guys undrafted to fit into a complementary role. Um, they managed to to draft a safety in Kayvon Wallace, but uh, they didn't. Most people assumed at some point they would get another corner. Um, and again, they they got a high profile undrafted kid, but um, didn't do it in the draft. And then we we already talked about edge rusher. That's another position, and they waited to the seventh round to take a bit of a tweener. So, yeah, I mean, but you can say that about every team. Um, Did they address all their needs? No. Did they go overboard at receiver? Probably. And they want – see, the problem is they want – you know, they spent too much time on stopwatch speed. They want just for speed guys. And it's going to be interesting. I I mean, if you talked about Hightower versus Watkins – to me, I mean, Watkins is the more multi-dimensional player. Like he can manu- he, you could give him in the football and manufactured stuff. So I would think, even though he got drafted after, I would think he would have the leg up. Uh, I do want to get a quick thought on Sean Bradley, the linebacker, uh, and also Davion Taylor, the linebacker. Two guys uh, at a position of need. Um, either one of them guys project to be better than what they already have, which isn't all that good. Well, same thing as receiver. Um, 
they went for really fast guys uh, who are raw. Um, and, and particularly when you look at Davion Taylor, because he's the third round pick. And in theory, that's the guy you would want to be in, in at least some kind of role as a rookie. I, I mean, because of his religion, he's a seventh day Adventist. Uh, it's not often you see that in an NFL scouting report, but he wasn't allowed to play high school football. So we talk about raw. Um, their Sabbath is from Friday night to Sunday morning. So, you know, we talk about Friday night lights and high school football. He didn't get to play high school football because of his religion um, and played, I think, one game in high school uh, because it, it started before sundown. Um, that's how far back he is uh, as far as obviously the typical uh, prospect who gets um, a lot of – uh, experience in high school and then through college. but So that's the bad part. The positive part is, you know, once he did get to, to college, he had to go to junior college first because nobody recruited him because he didn't play high school football. And he was so good. He was so fast. He's like a sprinter playing linebacker. Um, and he managed uh, to get a scholarship out in Arizona and turned into an NFL third-round pick. I mean, that's pretty impressive. But at the same time, again, tremendously, tremendously raw player coming into a situation with COVID-19 where there's no offseason. I, I think it's, you know, when I talk about boom or bust, maybe Taylor more than any, it might look really bad year one. But he might turn into something special year two or year three. I just think there's going to be a pretty big ramp up period. Yeah, uh, looking through the draft class with John McMullen, that's a good point. You know, Taylor, very, very raw uh, when you look at things. And then uh, I do want to look at Driscoll real fast. He was a right tackle in college, but most people projected him to play on the inside. And I guess... Um, you know, that's a spot. I don't know um, when you look at the Eagles offensive line, obviously Vitae was such an important piece and kind of moved all over the place there. Uh, Matt Pryor uh, kind of roll, uh, went into that role last year. They have Nate Herbig as well. Uh, so Jake uh, Driscoll or Jack Driscoll would be kind of, I guess, in play there. I guess somebody asked him if he could play center as well too, right? Yeah, and, and that's because that's what the Eagles' plan is. They're trying to turn him into a Stefan Wisniewski type. So even though he played right tackle at Auburn, he kind of knew he's been preparing. Most NFL teams saw him as a guard. Uh, but the Eagles have been looking for that type of player uh, since Wiz um, left, the guy who can seamlessly go between center and both guard spots. And you know, Driscoll's really, really smart. He started at UMass. He was a grad transfer down to Auburn and, and got his MBA already. So he's really smart. And, and you know, Jeff Stoutland, with the, he just wants cerebral guys playing the center position. So that's why he kind of targeted him uh, to be that player. And that's the plan. So it's obviously a projection. But the Eagles want him to be that interior guy who can move back and forth from the center position uh, to both guard positions. And, and then you also have to put in the equation Jason Kelsey. You don't know how long he's going to play. And every year he goes through it, he joked about it this year, said he's retiring from, I think, bowling, whatever he said. Arm wrestling. Uh, arm wrestling, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say darts. I don't know. Uh so, but he's getting closer and closer to walking away. And it can happen any of these years. And so you got to think about that part of it as well. And if you have a versatile guy, then you can start talking about, say, Amalu as well. If he's better at center, you put Trisco at guard or vice versa. So you're trying to create options for yourself. Uh, the other guy would be uh, Kevon Wallace. Uh, you know, we, we kind of touched on him, but uh, is he – the successor to McLeod, does he play next to McLeod if Mil if Jalen Mills is not, uh, you know, capable? Um, what's the plan for Wallace for his rookie season? Uh, well, for his rookie season, I mean, 
and, and you know, it's special teams like anybody else. And um, you kind of work them in from there. Obviously, Will Parks is in the mix as well uh, to be the third safety. And as we mentioned, uh, with uh, the pandemic, it's going to be difficult for all rookies because they're not going to have the off season. So ultimately, I think he starts off as a four safety and playing on special teams. But long term, yeah, I think he's got a chance to be a starter uh, by year two uh, with the Eagles. And that is about projection. I think a lot of people look at him and say, well, he's the positionalist guy. He's more of the what they project Mills to be because he played at the line of scrimmage a lot at Clemson. But, you know, people get too caught up in what people did in college. It's about projection, just like we talked about with Driscoll. Yeah. Um, it's not what you did. It's what you can do at the next level. And I think the Eagles think he could be a center fielder, a single high safety. Just not a ton of size to be that guy near the line of scrimmage. Um, so ultimately, I think they're gonna they're gonna steer him in that direction. Uh, were you surprised that no corner was taken, and were uh, you know where they kind of stand at that position, which is Darius Slay, Sidney Jones, Maddox, Russell Douglas, Karan LeBronc? They did not add a corner. Yeah, a little bit. I, I thought they would draft a corner at some point. They did get Graylin Arnold, who's a pretty high profile undrafted free agent from Baylor. A lot of people had him having draftable, uh, a draftable grade. So uh, they did go a little bit heavy in undrafted free agency. But, yeah, I mean, I, they're better off at corner than they've been in a while. Let's put it that way. So it's not as big as a concern. You know, you do have some competition set up. You don't have to worry about Slay as long as he's healthy. Um now you have Nikhil Roby Coleman playing the slot, so you don't have to worry about that if he's healthy. And you have Avante Maddox kicking outside with Sidney Jones pushing him uh, at right corner. Kravon LeBlanc, you got a backup slot, slot corner. And you still have Rasul Douglas. They want to trade him, but they haven't been able to trade him. So they have plenty of bodies. Um, but we've seen enough of Rasul and the fact that the Eagles um, – are shopping him. They don't really want to bring him back to be uh, that other backup outside corner. So they would like somebody to seize that job. And maybe it's Arnold, but I, I thought they would have drafted one. And maybe, yeah, maybe that's the position you say. Instead of taking, instead of going overboard the receivers, maybe you should have took a corner. All right, uh, John McMullen, of course, football at four at JF McMullen. Check out his stuff at Sports Illustrated. And uh, football at four is back tomorrow. We uh, continue to look at the Eagles offseason building forward. The NFL continues as they have some contingencies, as we discussed yesterday um, uh, on uh, the schedules moving forward. That's going to be May the 7th. And, of course, uh, boy, uh, this offseason, we don't know where it goes from here. This might be it. Normally, you get the mini camps, the training camps, and everything. You, we might be out of football after this. Uh, no, we're never. You know that. I mean, we didn't even get to jail and hurts. Howie Roseman still trying to put out that fire. Yeah, trying to put it out again. Now he's shifted gears a little bit. Uh, well, I, tomorrow we we I, today we I wanted to kind of we didn't give the rest of the draft class a little bit of room yesterday. Uh, but tomorrow I'm sure Hertz will be right back up because, as you said, yes, uh, he, he's kind of spinning stuff. The national uh, people, a lot of the national people, are seemingly liking it. Oh, well, I, I, I mean, <laughs> he, he tries to spin it in a certain, certain direction. And as I always say, there's people that get stories for a reason if they want to give out yeah. Howie's narrative. Uh, well, there but, was a, the Peter King uh, thing today, I guess it was, was, you know, they were really considering Chin at that spot and then I guess a running back. And when they finally decided they were going to go with, uh, with Hertz, he was the guy uh, over Jeremy Chin, apparently. Yeah, and, and, and how he has gone back and forth and said, uh, you know, he brought up the Russell Wilson thing, as we mentioned a little bit yesterday, and, and feeling like they couldn't wait um, as they did back in 2012. Uh, but today, I, I thought the most interesting part, which we talked about earlier, was the fact that after the pick, they acted like it wasn't a big deal. 
And I, I, I said two things at the time. Either this team is incredibly tone deaf or they're just lying. And it turns out they were just lying. They knew. They knew that the, the atmosphere would create – uh, and it has created that atmosphere. And how he finally said today, yeah, Carson wasn't happy. But, I mean, is that a surprise to people? You can go back to John Elway with Tommy Maddox, Brett Favre with Aaron Rodgers, and now Aaron Rodgers is going through the same thing with Jordan Love. And even when Carson came in, Sam Bradford wasn't happy. Well, he did say, I don't know, I mean, he said, you know, uh, on what Saturday, I guess it was, uh, that – he did have a conversation with Carson, and then it was a you know it was an uncomfortable conversation. But ultimately, he was on board with it. I mean, has he has he changed from that? Well, he just he just mentioned it, it, it was a difficult conversation, uh, which is is uh, a sea change from where he was right after the draft. And he said uh, Carson was on board. Uh, when he did his Zoom call with us. But, you know, I, I talk about this all the time. I mean, you think about any first-round pick in the draft, take a look at Jalen Rager. You think Greg Ward is happy? Yeah. You know, he's not happy. Anytime you get – they're saying, well, we got to get better at this position. Uh, but at the quarterback, it's obviously magnified. And the fact that you're coming off a year where you gave Carson Wentz – more guaranteed money than anybody in the history of this game. It is a very, very weird draft pick. And the Eagles should have acknowledged that from day one. Yeah. I they definitely I definitely think, John, the message for them is we won the Super Bowl with the quarterback room, and that's the way we're going back. We, we want that quarterback room being the best that it can be again because that's the one way they know how to win a Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, I think it's more of uh, I think it's more of the insurance policy. I think there's part, and I mentioned it, and I wrote about it. There's a bunch of parts. The innovation of the game, I mentioned. Uh, what you just said about the quarterback room and about how valuable the backup quarterback position, that's part of it. But if you want to put percentages on it, 80 to 85% is our starting quarterback hasn't been there in the playoffs for three consecutive years. This yeah. team has been in the playoffs three consecutive years. Carson's only been there once. He was knocked out early last year. Essentially didn't play in that game. That's that's what it's about, more than anything else, if you're putting a percentage on it. Uh, football for Johnny Mack at J.F. McMullen. Make sure you give him a follow, of course, tomorrow. We're back. We'll do more on uh, that and the Eagles and the offseason and the NFL, and it never goes away. Thanks, pal. All right, thanks, Mike. Yeah, Johnny Mack, like all guests, appeared via the Boardwalk Honda Hotline.